Apostolic Canonization of the New Testament before AD 70, Part 1 by Ed Stevens for the Summer 2009 issue of Fulfilled Magazine, Volume 4, Issue 2 Narrated by David Clark This article affirms that all 27 books of the New Testament were written, collected and certified as authoritative by the Apostles before they passed the earthly scene, just before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The word canon simply means the list of sacred writings considered by Christians as inspired, inerrant and absolutely authoritative for all matters of doctrine and practice. Although the New Testament does not use the word canon or canonical in reference to its contents or to the collection of Old Testament books, the concepts of canonicity and canonization, including such concepts as inspiration, authority, direct revelation and scripture, are found in the New Testament. In this article we will look at some New Testament contexts where these concepts are either implicitly or explicitly mentioned. Contrary to the claims of the Roman Catholic Church, it did not give us the canon of scripture. The Holy Spirit did. The Roman Church's claim is based on the idea of apostolic succession. As we Protestants are quick to point out, the office of apostle, specifically the twelve apostles of Christ, not the apostles or missionaries of the churches like Barnabas or Mark, require direct eyewitness experience of the resurrected Christ. Full inspiration and empowerment by the paraclete the Holy Spirit or Comforter, and direct revelation and commission from Christ. The only exception to this were those whom Jesus directly commissioned, such as Paul and James, or those upon whom Peter and the Apostles laid their hands, such as Mark, Luke, Jude, using the canonical authority, the keys of the kingdom, Mark 16, 19, that Christ had given to Peter. That authority passed away permanently when Peter and the other inspired apostles and prophets left the earthly scene. If that authority of Peter and the apostles had been given to each successive generation of church leaders, i.e. apostolic succession, after the passing of Peter and the apostles, it would mean that the gift of inspiration was also passed down perpetually, thus keeping the canon open forever. The Mormons, especially with their Book of Mormon, would love the idea of canon still being open, as would the Moonies, with their writings of Sun, Young, Moon. The Roman Catholic idea of apostolic secession opens the door to all kinds of confusion and corruption to creep into the Church, and cheapens the idea of inspiration, inerrancy and absolute authority of the true canon of Scripture. However, this idea of a closed canon by the time of the passing of the Apostles is a sword that cuts both ways. Not only does it rule out the Roman Church's claim of having the right to decide the contents of our canon, it rules out all other claims by Protestants and the cults as well. What we are affirming here is that the Apostles were the only ones who had the inspiration and authority to not only write inspired scripture, but also to infallibly decide which books which were authoritative. Subsequent church leaders were neither inspired, inerrant eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ, nor directly commissioned by him. This means that the only Christians who were ever qualified to set the boundaries of the New Testament canon were those very apostles who wrote the inspired books in the first place. This view is called apostolic canonization. It is not a new theory, nor is it exclusive to preterism. The challenge of both Protestant and Catholics is now clear. Does the New Testament canon historical evidence which demonstrates not only that the apostles wrote the inspired books, but also made an authoritative certified collection of them? This is the burden that this series of articles and to demonstrate this we must go back to the Athanasian Canon of the 4th century, before the Moratorian Fragment.
late second century, 170 AD, and even before the New Testament books were written, to look at the Old Testament basis for the development of a New Testament canon. We find a chain of, of canonical authority that begins with Moses and ends with the prophet like Moses. The Lord said to me, Moses, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whosoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Deuteronomy 18, 17 to 19. Peter speaking, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you, and it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Acts 3, 22 to 23. While he, Peter, was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them during the transfiguration, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Matthew 17, verse 5, Luke 9, 35. Jesus was the prophet, like Moses, who was to come. Moses was the archetype, both in the spoken word and the written word. Moses first spoke the word, then later wrote it down. Christ certainly spoke the word, but did not write it down. But we can see in the pages of the New Testament that Jesus was making preparations through the paraclete for his word to be written down by his apostles and prophets. Interesting in this regard is Christ's statement about the value of a scribe who becomes a disciple of the kingdom. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure new things and old. Matthew 13, 52. The scribe who became a disciple of Jesus would use his talents to produce treasures both new and old. Note the word new here. None of the twelve apostles were scribes by trade, as far as we know. So this means Jesus anticipated some scribes becoming Christians and using their writings and copying skills to produce some new canonical scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the oversight of the twelve apostles. Both Mark and Luke might fit this scenario. Several times Jesus mentioned to the apostles the coming work of the Paraclete. Do not worry about how or what you shall say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Matthew 10, 19, 20. Jesus promised to send them the Holy Spirit, who would teach all things, bring you to your remembrance all that I say unto you, guide you into all the truth, and disclose to you what is to come. John 14, 26. Notice the use of the word all in three of these phrases regarding the work of the paraclete. This does not sound like the canon would be left open after the paraclete finished giving them all things, all truth, and brought to their remembrance all that Jesus wanted them to teach. Nothing would be left out. The Holy Spirit would make sure the whole word of Christ was completely revealed, taught and written down, after which the canon would be closed. Just before his ascension, Christ claimed he had all authority, including canonical authority, in heaven and earth, and therefore commissioned the Twelve, and Paul later, see Romans 1.5, Galatians 1, 1 to 16, to make disciples of all the nations and to teach them to observe all that he had commissioned them, and that he would be with them all, the days until the end of the age, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. Notice that the very authority, all authority in heaven and earth, which Jesus claimed to have, was the very authority Moses said that the prophet like him would have, Deuteronomy 18, 19, and that the prophet, like Moses, would speak all that God commanded him to speak. 
Jesus said repeatedly to his disciples, Matthew 11, 27, John 3, 35, 5, 22, 13, 3, 17, 2, that the Father had given him all the words and all the authority and that he was now commissioning, authorising them to go and teach all the nations, all that he had taught them. The king was sending out his authorised emissaries through the work of the paraclete, Jesus passed all of his inspired words as well as the authority and the authorization to teach it and to write it down and certify it as true to Peter and the apostles. In addition to the great commission authority given generally to the twelve, Peter was also given the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 16, 19, which included canonical authority, whereas Peter bound or loosed Whatever Peter bound or loosed on earth was to be considered to be bound or closed by Christ himself in heaven. But that authority was not passed on to succeeding generations of church leaders after Peter. Christ sent the paraclete to be with the apostles all the days of their lifetime to enable them to complete the great commission before the end of the age. The paraclete's presence with them and his work in and through them would continue to the end of the age. If the end of the age is still future, then the Roman Catholic age of apostolic succession must be true. However, it seems clear from Jesus' use of the phrase end of the age in Matthew 24, 3, that the end refers to the end of the Jewish age, AD 70. This means that the disciples would have com completed the proclamation of the gospel before the end of the age, AD 70. Both the apostle Paul and Eusebius affirm this was accomplished. The gospel has been made known to all nations, Romans 16, 25 to 27, Romans 10, 18, 15 and 19. The gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Colossians 1, 5 to 6. The gospel that you have heard which was preached in all creation under heaven. Colossians 23, 123. At that very time indeed, the voice of his holy apostles went throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, 3a11. The exclusive authority to deliver Christ, one true distinctive gospel was only given to the first century apostles and prophets, Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 16, 19. So, all, whatever he bound or loosed, would be authoritative for all generations to all to come. Once for all, delivered to the saints, Jude 3, emphasis mine. Whatever else this binding and loosing authority might have meant, it at least included the authority to write, collect and certify the canon of scripture. So if Peter allowed or disallowed something, it was considered to have been bound or loosed by Christ himself. Evidently, Peter recognized, canonized James and Jude as inspired witnesses of their risen brother Jesus. The same way he recognized, canonized Paul as an inspired witness of the resurrection of Christ. According to tradition, Mark and Luke wrote under the supervision of Peter and Paul, respectively. Jude 3 affirms that Peter and those whom Peter canonised did deliver, i.e. write, collect and certify that inspired canon faithfully. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down and delivered to the saints. Jude 3. The canonical authority which Peter possessed was not passed down successively to each new generation of church leaders. After the passing of Peter and the other apostles from the earth seen, no one has the authority to write, collect and certify the canon because they are unable, neither inspired nor empowered to do so. The Roman church failed to realise that the inspiration and empowerment was not passed down successively to each new head bishop of the Roman church. 
that failure raises a new, a whole host of historical issues that need to be analysed by Petrus as we continue the process of reformation and restoration. Evangelical Christians affirm that the first century apostles were inspired and their writings were canonical, but we have not yet taken the next logical step to conclude that the only ones who could infallibly decide which book were canonical were those who had been divinely inspired to write them in the first place. The apostles and Peter significantly accomplished that writing, collection and certification of the canon before they left the earthly scene. In the following articles we will look more closely at each of the three stages or steps in the process of delivering the canon to the saints. Writing, collecting and certifying. The burden of those holding the canonical or canonization view is to demonstrate that all three steps occurred during the lifetime and under the oversight of the Twelve Apostles and Peter especially in the first century before AD 70.